Our next speaker, uh, Stephen Palumbi, is the Jane and Marshall Steele Jr. Professor of Marine Scientists uh, Sciences at Stanford University, as well as Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute of the Environment. Dr. Palumbi is best known for his work on molecular genetics applied to marine biology and conservation-related concerns. His research has also explored the effects of human activity on the ocean. He's the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including his recent election to the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Palumbi has participated in many films and TV series as well, including the documentary, documentary TV series titled The Future is Wild. He's the author of over 200 publications and several books, including The Extreme Life of the Sea, published in 2014. Dr. Palumbi received his BA in biology from Johns Hopkins University and a PhD in marine ecology from the University of Washington. Please join me in welcoming Steve Palumbi. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much, uh, Arthur, for setting this up, Alexis, for that introduction, um, and all of you for coming uh, to hear about this amazing um, set of conditions that that we're in. Uh, Michael laid it out in an extraordinary way. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is to, is to talk a little bit from the perspective of the oceans, um, but also talk a little bit from the perspective of an optimist. I'm an optimist. Um, and when I see what's going on in the world, especially when you hear the litany of incredibly important uh, and irrefutable facts that Michael lays out, um, it's hard to find that corridor of optimism. Um, but that's the corridor we're traveling, and that's the corridor the oceans are in. And so uh, I find it uh, important to try to understand how we might make it, and what are the important things about uh, the ocean and how climate change is affecting it and affecting us. Um, looking around, um, any of you marine biologists? Well, I think what I ought to do is start with a little bit of a primer in, in, in marine biology. Um, I only have a few minutes, so a 47-second marine biology degree is what we're going to try to going to try to do. That is flipping by. Can you make that work for me, please? <laughs> That was enough, wasn't it? <laughs> that was uh, edited by an undergraduate student of mine, Zach Gold, and that's my, my daughter's rock and roll band's uh, song on it. Uh, and what it shows you is about 100 species of marine life, a wide variety of different colors, a wide variety of different lifestyles, and that's the ocean. That is the life of the ocean and the kinds of things that, that we get to work on. Um, and all of it, absolutely all of it, is being affected by climate change in various uh, times and various places. And, and what, I, what I was asked to do by Arthur is to go through some of the, some of the impacts. Um, Michael's talked a lot about some of, the, some of these things already, so we can, we, can, we can do those a little faster. Um, sea level rise, for example, is something that Michael, Michael talked about. And from the standpoint of a marine biologist, that, that's great. There's more ocean out there uh, than there ever has been. But what's important about this is, is to realize that um, we understand why this is happening. Uh, as the world has warmed, as Michael showed us, the ocean has been warming. And as the ocean warms, the water 
um, becomes, has a little bit more volume to it. We can measure how much volume water has when you add just a few tenths of a degree to it, and that predicts pretty well the, the change in sea level that we've seen. But that's accelerating uh, because of other aspects of how the ocean is being changed by, um, by not only heat, but also the flow of water into it. So um, we do understand how these things have played out. And as Michael has said, right now the ocean is about 10 inches to a foot uh, higher than it has been in our recent past. That is, is accelerated. Um, how much more ocean is that? I was struck exactly like Michael was by the idea that rocks falling into the ocean would actually be that. Um, well, you know, it seems like that's way too big of a problem, but I, let's just walk through it. How much extra volume is that? We can figure that out, right? Uh, you can Google the, the area of the ocean. It's 360 million square kilometers. 10 seconds is all it takes to get that information. Then the amount of extra volume is about a quarter of a meter or so. Multiply that out, you get the extra volume of the ocean. All of us can do that. Uh, the volume increase is about 90,000 cubic kilometers. That seems too much, so I decided, let's put it in, in other terms. How many Empire State Buildings would you have to push into the ocean in order to get it to rise a foot? Again, you can Google the volume of the Empire State Building. Who knew? Uh, it'll take 90 million Empire State Buildings falling into the ocean in order to give us the sea level rise that we want. This is the figure that the eminent Republican congressman that Mike talked about didn't mention. That yes, in fact, rocks falling into the ocean would do it, but would it take 90 million Empire State Building equivalents to do it? That's not happening. It actually comes from a very different, a very different process of, of climate change. Um, of course, estimates of how much ocean there's going to be in the future, uh, the sea level rise, depend on other things. It might seem like those are way too uncertain. Again, that is the, the nature of the op-ed that came out in the Wall Street Journal last week. Um, of course, it depends on the emission rates. It depends on if the ice sheets collapse. And, and it also varies in some places more than others. None of this is a surprise, and all of it just shows us how much we know about the process, not how much we don't know about the process. Here's some measurements of, of sea level trends up until about 2003. Um, you see some places sea level rise is actually going up faster. Galveston, that's because Galveston is sinking. A natural process. In Sitka, Alaska, sea level rise is actually stopped. They're actually negative. Why? Because Sitka is rising. Sitka doesn't have the glaciers on it that it used to during the maximum uh, ice ages, and so the land is rebounding. You want to get oceanfront property and be sure that it's going to be oceanfront uh, in the next century or so? Sitka, Alaska is the place that you want, want to go. <laughs> Uh, San Francisco is not the place you want to go. Where, where I live, the map on the upper left is current sea level. Um, the map on the lower right is predicted uh, extent of the coast in San Francisco at a, at a meter sea level rise. It's not even the two meters that Michael was talking about. So you can see there's going to be a lot more area for sailboating and for recreational fishing in the San Francisco Bay Area. What you can't see from that is that a huge amount of what we actually as gen generating the California and the American economy will be underwater. All the new campuses of Google, Apple, Facebook, Oracle are all underwater and under that, that picture. Uh, so as we think about the impact of sea level, even though um, we're not in a place right here that's going to be affected too much by it, it will affect all of us. I did look at the maps um, for Cleveland. And you really don't have that much to worry about for sea level rise. Uh, a little bit on, the, on your coast, but not a whole, not a whole lot. Um, the other point about this is that these cities, not just in the United States, um, but all around the world are increasingly where people live. A large fraction of our fellow human beings live on coastlines, live in big cities on coastlines. And projections over the next 100 years is that that urbanization, especially of coastlines, will continue. So it's not like a small fraction of us are going to be living in places where this is going on. A very large fraction of us is. And a very large fraction of our built infrastructure is living in those areas where sea level rise is going on. 
the other aspect of this is that um, organisms that live on coasts can actually keep up with sea level rise to a certain extent. Uh, corals in particular that we'll talk about later are wonderful living seawalls. They're self-repairing, they keep growing, they are capable of uh, fixing themselves after storms, but they can only grow so fast. And sea level rise that is relatively low can be kept up by things like corals, oyster beds, even salt marshes. Uh, but if we exceed their capacity, or if in fact we diminish their ability to grow, then we're taking this natural sea protection that we've had for, for millions of years and we're eliminating it. The second sort of thing that I wanted to talk about briefly are, are king tides because uh, these are tides that are now so big that they're beginning to flood coastal cities. Uh, we can look at a map like I just showed you of San Francisco and say, well, that isn't for 100 years. It's not, not happening right now. But in cities all over the world, uh, there are king tides. Those are spring tides. Those are the special high tides of the year. They happen two or three, uh, four times a year. Uh, and what's happening in many cities as a consequence of that is that during the middle of the day, it's bright and sunny, there isn't any rain, and there is water coming up the storm drains. It's not going back down, it's coming up. And that's because those king tides on those coastal cities are bringing water in higher than the streets themselves. Uh, South Miami Beach is repaving its streets to be about a foot higher than they were before in order to get away from that. There's an entire company in Florida that makes a new manhole cover, a new cover for storm drains that doesn't let water come up them. It only lets water go down. Uh, so these are ways that we've been trying to figure out how to deal with this particular problem. Um, but it's happening all over the country. If you look at the incidence of king tides in the news over the last couple of decades, 40 years ago, it just simply wasn't ever in the news. Now, these kinds of features are happening all the time. Has anybody, anybody here been to Venice? All right, ever, the, the St. Mark's Plaza is underwater about half the time. Now, Venice is sinking, but the sea level is also going up. And that's the sort of process that is happening more and more in countries all over. The third major effect uh, in the oceans is something that really is special for the oceans, and that is ocean acidification. Uh, CO2 in the atmosphere is the problem causing greenhouse gases, but a lot of it is uh, the CO2 content in the atmosphere is less than it would be because the ocean has been absorbing it. CO2, when it dissolves in the ocean, goes through a whole set of chemical processes, but basically it turns into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid makes the ocean more acidic, drops the pH from about 8.1 or 8.05, down and down and down. And so we look at the level of acidity in the ocean. It's gone up by about 25 or 26 percent just over the last couple of decades. Uh, this is a little coral um, from Palau. Uh, it's just sitting in regular vinegar. What happens when you put calcium carbonate, which is the shell material that goes into corals and bivalves and all that, in an acidic environment is that the acidity causes the calcium carbonate to be released back into CO2. And if you put it into a pretty acidic environment like vinegar, um, it starts bubbling. So that's what's happening here. That skeleton is bubbling away. It's dissolving because of the acidity. Now, vinegar is way more acidic than the ocean is ever going to get, but this little piece of coral dissolved in about two hours. And it exemplifies the fact that all marine organisms, where they're in a more acidified ocean, and they're trying to build their shells, they are fighting against this thermodynamic problem of the acidity making their shells more solvable, uh, dissolvable. Uh, this is a, a graph showing the cross-section through three clams. 
Um, and they were grown, the top one was grown at our regular CO2 levels, 390 parts per million, um, which was normal a couple of years ago. And then um, the middle one, CO2 levels of 750 parts per million, which we project about the ocean uh, level at the end of the century under many different emission standards. And then twice that. And what you can see in the, in the cross section there is that the higher the CO2 level, uh, the thinner and thinner and thinner the shell is. These clams are grown in clam nirvana. They are given all the food they can eat. They're not being chased by predators. They're growing as fast as they possibly can. But with extra CO2, um, they just cannot make shell faster, fast enough, uh, faster than the dissolving features of the extra acidity. And that is going on uh, in all marine systems. Um, all around the world. There are about 190 scientific studies now of the role of acidification on the growth of marine organisms. A colleague of mine, Christy Croker, um, put together some of the recent uh, articles uh, about this. Uh, this is what she calls the mean effect size. Anything above zero means that there's a positive effect of acidification on this feature, which is calcification, the building of shells, um, for uh, everything is on the far left. And then um, next are calcium-covered algae, called coralline algae, uh, corals, uh, small little things called coccolithophores, small plankton, um, gastropods, echinoderms, and crustaceans. And you can see, actually, uh, not everything does terribly. Um, echinoderms and crustaceans actually uh, aren't that affected by acidification, but a large part of the underlying food chain of the ocean, in particular calcifiers like mollusks and, uh, and corals, uh, are very much affected and negatively by, by, cal by <coughs> acidification. We've actually seen this play out now uh, in some industries on the west coast and on the east coast uh, and the northeast coast. A, a very big industry in Washington and Oregon and in the northeast coast is oyster farming. Uh, oysters start by with small little larvae called oyster spat. They're settled down and then grown out in bays and estuaries all over, all over the country. Those spat, those tiny little larvae, are very sensitive to pH. And when those larvae are grown under pH conditions that mimic the, um, the future ocean conditions, many of them have a very hard time growing. In fact, they don't grow at all. In Oregon, uh, as, a, as an example, uh, the entire oyster industry um, came nearly a, to a grinding halt because of this problem. And we actually discovered something we wouldn't have known if we hadn't done all of this climate science, that there was already a CO2 problem in coastal waters. It wasn't just the global problem. But it was also local acidification storms where poor water quality caused the growth of microbes that increased the CO2 content of local coastal waters, dropped the pH, and led to the collapse of the oyster farms in those areas. And one of the best times when oyster farmers and aquaculturists and scientists and planners like NOAA got together was when we came together to say, what can we do about this to solve this $100 million industry in Oregon and Washington? And just by knowing what the cause was, this, these acidification storms, um, those farmers and those scientists could figure out ways, um, ways around that. So the fourth effect is um, temperature. And that is one of the biggest effects. And it's affecting all sorts of organisms all over the, all over the planet. Um, I'll talk a little bit about corals, but I wanted to start with whales. Because uh, you, these are organisms you think will just be too big to be worried about things like, like temperature. Uh, and they wouldn't have changed that much. Um, but things are changing in lots of marine species because of temperature. As the oceans have warmed species of fishery concern, species of recreational concern, and species of conservation concern like whales are changing where they live and how they live. And so here's, here's an example. This is where whales, gray whales, used to feed near Alaska, between Alaska and Siberia, near a set of islands called the Privilof Islands. The colored dots there are uh, whales feeding south of or near the south of the Pribilofs, and then there's a few whales up there in the north, those little black dots. Um, these uh, were basically feeding records from uh, the early 70s and, and uh, 19, 1980s. But what's happened since then is that cold water uh, is shifting north. 
And gray whales feed on a very special kind of tube building crustacean that lives only in cold water. And as that cold water shifted north, so has their food supply. So gray whales have started swimming further and further north in order to find their food. As they go further and further north, they get through that strait between Siberia and Alaska. They go up north of Alaska, up north of Canada, and they kind of lose their way. And in two instances, we've seen gray whales come back after their summer feeding, but make a wrong turn. They're so far north that when they come back, they go into the Atlantic instead of the Pacific. So one gray whale is actually found off the coast of Israel. Gray whales live in the Pacific. There's no gray whale that we know of that ever was off the coast of Israel until this one. And then another one showed up off the coast of South Africa. These whales, no one's seen them again. Can't imagine that they've survived. But they, their migration pathway was utterly disrupted by moving so far north to find food uh, that their normal way of coming back south again um, couldn't, couldn't work. Uh, we're seeing this in a lot of organisms. Uh, their migration pathway is changing, and their way, the places that they're living around the world um, are changing. So even as we are noticing climate change and what it's doing, uh, the organisms in the world are also noticing climate change and how it affects, how it affects them. I want to talk a little bit more about corals uh, because they're an emblematic of the kinds of uh, impact that climate change has on important ecosystems that are important to us. Uh, Michael mentioned this coral bleaching is when coral skeletons turn, turn white. Um, why do they turn white is because they're very sensitive to, uh, okay. they're very sensitive to temperature. Uh, coral loss around the world is up to 40 to 50 percent uh, since about 19, uh, the mid 1970s uh, from a lot of causes. Uh, but the spikes in coral death are caused by the increase in ocean temperature. We, we know a lot about how this is played out um, by looking at individual corals and how they react to temperature. And what I want to show you is what is going on with bleaching, how it actually affects corals. Uh, we work in a place called Ofu in American Samoa in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And we work on these offshore reefs with back reef pools where we study individual, individual corals. Well, corals are great uh, study organisms. Um, they're colonies. Each coral like this is made up of a set of branches. As you zoom in on those branches, then what you can see are small little polyps that make up each of those individual corals that make a branch. Each individual polyp here has tentacles around it with a mouth inside, and all the polyps are genetically identical. They grow as colonies. And as you keep going in and in, the color here is not the coral. The color here is a symbiont, a symbiotic alga that is sitting inside coral cells. And, and the, the focus will rack up and down here a little bit. You can just about see the golden globes of these symbionts in the, in the coral. Corals are simple animals. They have two cell layers. The inner cell layer is called the gastroderm. The outer cell layer is called the epidermis. And it's in that gastroderm that the algal symbiont sits. It's big. It's almost as big as the whole cell. And it's a kind of alga called a dinoflagellate. We see them floating around the ocean all the time. They're photosynthetic, like all dinoflagellates are, and they produce food for the coral. The yellow thing is their chloroplast, the place where they gather light energy and turn it into chemical energy. We know a lot about what goes on with global warming and bleaching. So we go into the chloroplast. We go into things called thylakoid membranes. We go deeper into those. There's proteins floating around in those membranes. And those proteins catch photons, Q photons. Right, got that right. Um, those floating proteins capture that photon energy and they turn it into chemical energy. That's photosynthesis. But if the whole system heats up too much, the ability to turn photon energy into chemical energy breaks down. And those floating rafts of proteins still have the energy because they've captured it. They just can't do anything with it. So that turns into something called reactive oxygen species. That extra photon energy, the electrons go into oxygen. That reactive oxygen species is quite toxic. As it diffuses out from the chloroplast, the, the coral cell spits 
the alga out. And if one cell does it, it's just getting rid of an offending cell, an offending um, symbiont. But if all the coral cells do it all at the same time because the temperature is up, then the entire branch of that coral turns white because it's lost its pigment. And if all the, all the cells in all of the coral do that, then the entire colony turns white. And that's coral bleaching. It leads to a coral that is not dead, but it's lost its major food source. It's essentially kicked out its, its rent paying tenant. And because of that, um, those corals largely die of starvation in, in a short period of time. Uh, as a consequence of that bleaching, we have seen corals dying over vast swaths of the ocean. Coral bleaching around the world, particularly the Great Barrier Reef, but also in the Caribbean and also in the Pacific and also in the Indian Ocean, is the single most visible ecosystem impact of climate change we have right now. It happens regularly. It ha you can see it from space. Other ecosystems are, other impacted by cl are also impacted by climate change, but this is the preeminent one uh, that you can see. Uh, so we began working in this as a research question by noticing something that really has been some seen by all my colleagues all the time. When a bleaching event happens, not all the corals bleach. Even when 90% of them bleach, 10% of them don't. So from an evolutionary biologist and ecologist point of view, the question is, why don't the 10% that didn't bleach, why didn't they bleach? Sometimes, like in this picture from Hawaii, two corals of exactly the same species are next to one another, one bleaches and one doesn't. It gave us some thinking that there might be variation in corals for the propensity or the tendency to bleach, and what can we use that for in order to understand bleaching and, and its consequences. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of what we've been able to do um, just in a few minutes just to see the kinds of work that climate science ex excites you to do as a scientist out in, in the natural world. Uh, this is where we work in Ofu in American Samoa. Um, and where we operate is in the back reef area. Um, those little dots there represent corals that we have mapped and we've been following for about 10 years. We have thermometers on all of them. We know what their temperatures are. And the ones up in the upper right there I get a lot or don't warm up too much. The ones in the lower left warm up a lot more because of the nature of how the water flows around this, around this pool. Um, we can actually understand how much corals bleach when they're exposed to heat by building a coral stress tank. This is sort of like a cardiac stress treadmill except it imposes heat stress on corals. It can do it in a very uh, standardized way, in a way that is small enough and is a piece of equipment. We can put it on a plane and take it anywhere. Um, our, our hope is to give these to high schools all over the Pacific so that people um, can actually measure these quantities themselves. We expose corals to a particular heat stress and then measure how much of the chlorophyll they have left in them uh, because the symbionts have chlorophyll. Uh, and when we do that, we discover that um, in our warmest pool down there on the lower left of that picture I showed you, those corals are a lot stronger and they're a lot more heat resistant than the corals that are living in the cooler pool on the other side, the other side of the reef. So just by doing this experiment, we've been able to map a little bit where the, the warm water heat resistant corals live in this, in this environment. Um, we have done the kind of experiment an ecologist would. We see two places with two different kinds of corals living there. We can do a reciprocal transplant. Take some corals from the cool pool, move them to the warm pool, warm pool to cool pool, retest them. And what we find when we do that is that uh, there's a little bit of a change that the warm, cool, the warm water corals, when moved to the cool pool, um, are a little bit more heat resistant than the ones that are there. If you take ones from the cool pool and you move them into the warm pool, they gain heat resistance. So that means that the corals can actually change their physiology a little bit, but they don't come all the way up to what the warm pool corals can do. What that tells us in these experiments is that when you look around the world at different corals, there's two kinds of things going on. The coral physiology and its history of where it's lived in the pool makes a difference. And then also that the genes these corals have when they're living in a cool pool tune them to living in those particular places. Um, we've done a whole set of experiments on what the genes are. 
there are about 100 genes in corals that allow them to be more heat resistant um, than, than other corals. Um, this is just one of my grad students um, sampling some of the corals that, um, that she had found. Um, this is just one place in American Samoa. And what we wanted to do was to um, look in a different place, a bigger place. So we moved the research to Palau, you can see why, and uh, looked at a different kind of coral reef environment called a patch reef. Patch reefs are uh, very common in coral reefs all over the world. Um, and when we started putting temperature thermometers on patch reefs, we found that, in fact, the tops of these patch reefs heat up. They expose the corals living on the tops of these patch reefs to very warm water conditions, just like we saw in Samoa. And it's given us hope that, in fact, these corals and these patch reefs might actually be heat resistant as, as well. Um, what the physics of it is is pretty simple. Uh, the patch reefs are areas of coral that grow up from the lagoon. They get close to the surface. At low tide, sunlight is heating up that water. And so anything living on the top of that patch reef is, is being exposed to warmer water. And that constant exposure to warmer water, tide by tide by tide, is what we think selects for corals that have this higher level of, of heat, heat resistance. Uh, what do we do with this information is the next thing. We've basically been trying to uh, do a little bit of what we would call conservation engineering. Can we take corals that are heat resistant and start to build coral nurseries that are also heat resistant? This is an experiment by a student of mine, Megan Morikawa. On that panel are a set of corals that are heat resistant and a set of corals that are not heat resistant from different parts of the reef. She let them grow, grow up. She had the great... Uh, luck, sort of, by doing this experiment right before the last El Nino. Uh, the entire experiment was affected by global bleaching, um, and it was able to show that, in fact, the corals that were heat resistant it bleached and were affected a lot less. So we have the ability, then, to use our stress test, look for corals that are heat resistant, and then do something with them um, in, in the future. Um, if you're a coral biologist or if you're a forest biologist or if you're a freshwater biologist, if you're, if you're not a physicist or if you're not a politician, um, how can you stop global climate change? Uh, we all know that it's a lot to do, mostly to do, fundamentally to do with emissions. Does that mean as a conservation biologist you have no role? The answer is, of course you have a role. That that role is a different role, and it's one where we try to look at the future, of the next century of the world, whether it's the ocean or the terrestrial sphere, and ask, what do, we, what do we hope in the next century? What we hope is that we'll solve the emissions problem. What we'll hope is that climate change will eventually start being pushed back, and the kinds of things that Michael was telling us about are, are the things that give us hope about that. Um, we all have to be part of that. But there's another role for conservation biology, and that's by saving as much as possible for this next century. Because once the climate change begins to roll back, what we want to do is rebuild this natural world. It will have been dramatically impacted by the next couple of decades, the next couple of, of 50 years or so. So our job is to stabilize as much as possible and to make as much of that um, be able to come back as possible. Um, Alexei mentioned this book, The Extreme Life of the Sea. I wrote this with my son, who's a novelist. And the idea of this book was to put together stories about how ocean life lives in different kinds of environments uh, with character and with scenery and with conflict and with the, the sorts of writing that, that novelists use and scientists don't know very much about. And maybe that would give us a better handle on being able to convey our message to, to more people. But at the end of it, we realized we really needed to really talk about how climate change was going to play out. Tony punted. He said, Dad, you have to write that part. I can't do that. And I wrote myself into a corner three or, three or four times in this last, paragraph, this last chapter. I couldn't figure out a way forward that seemed like it was going to work until I got to this grand bargain, which is what I've just laid out, that those of us who can dramatically impact the future of emissions in our country and the world should do so. 
Some of us will be able to do that. Some of us can't do that, we'll be working in other spheres. It doesn't mean we don't have a role. It means that we're partners in this. Our, our role is to save as much as possible while our friends and colleagues do their part. It's that grand bargain I wanna to try to leave you with, that no matter who we are, we have a role in this. Whether it's uh, changing your individual lifestyle to reduce carbon, whether it's being involved in politics, whether it's getting out the vote, whether it's saving species, we all have a role. We all have a planet. And our role in our planet are the same. What we're faced with is us, our children, and our children's children in a world that we're all gonna wanna live in and we all, of course, want our children and our grandchildren to thrive. So that's how we're gonna do it, by working together in these various ways. Take what you know, take what you love, do it. Do it in a way that makes it better for everybody. Thanks. And if you haven't yet, uh, please go ahead and give our students uh, any additional cards, questions you may have. Uh, they might have some extra ones too. So if you're looking for an extra card to write on, we might be able to get you those, just ask. So I think uh, there's lots in this presentation you gave that our audience can connect to. And even though you know, many of us are Clevelanders or Midwesterners, we've, a lot of us, if not most of us, I would say have been lucky enough to make our way to the ocean at one point or another. I grew up calling Lake Erie the beach, so. Um, but so uh, thinking about that a little bit more, and you touched on this a little bit at the end of your presentation. Uh, what do you find works to help kind of people click with climate change and the impact of climate change? Thinking about their visits to the beach as a kid, and, and, and I, I just see that as such a powerful idea that people can connect to. It's a little bit harder when maybe there's a hurricane happening, you know, thousands of miles away. But so give us some examples of how people have kind of connected with some of the science behind, even if they're not scientists, the science behind what you're talking about here. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, you know, way of, 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 of starting with this. Um, and, and there's two kinds of levels, one of which is, is that the, the science is, is global. It doesn't depend on whether you live in Cleveland or Houston or, or um, Vanuatu. Uh, and the science is still driving this, this process. And no matter whether you live in Cleveland or, or um, Houston or Vanuatu, there are signs that things are changing. And we can all see that. And that is another, another thing that sort of unites us, us all together. It may be that things like sea level rise is affecting Cleveland less than Miami. Um, but I think as Mike pointed out, we're all connected uh, when people start moving away from places they can no longer live any longer. Uh, we're connected when uh, the major infrastructure of our, of our nation is flooded all the time and we have to rebuild it. Someone's gonna pay for that and it's not just the people in, in Miami or Santa Barbara or New York. Um, and, and the flip side is that um, you live in the middle of a continent, you've got a wild swings in temperature, and no one would expect the people of Vanuatu to care that much about how bad your winters are from their perspective. But we all are affected by these different kinds of features. And so we all bring to the table the fact that our lives are changing, the fact that what we care about is changing, the fact that our, the underpinnings of our lives have changed. And I think it's important to realize that it's gonna be different for different people living in different places. And that it's okay if the people in Vanuatu are mostly concerned with, say, sea level rise because they live in a very low-lying uh, part of the world. And it's okay for, for people here to be mostly interested in, in droughts and floods and uh, um, severe winters and incredible heat waves because that's what you're going to experience. Um, that, I think that the experience of extremes is what unites us about that and the science is pretty clear that that's what we should expect. <laughs> 
what would help people connect too, if they, they understand sea level rise and the Miami Beach example sort of you, you gave. And can you talk a little bit more about the specifics? What, what actually, and this is a question from the audience, what actually is it going to mean? Will, will people have to sort of foreclose on their homes and, and in an everyday kind of sense, and I know we're asking you to predict the future a little bit here, but what will that mean for people who are living on the coast and, and what they're going to have to deal with as, as that happens? You know, we, we see it now. And um, I think Michael said this, that, that uh, we're seeing the footprint of extreme events even now. Uh, you see houses on the, on the outer banks of North Carolina that are destroyed by storms once, twice three times, four times. And it's this consistent wreckage of those homes, which tells you that's probably not a good place to have a home any longer. The other thing that we see is um, that the, as sea level goes up, um, you might think 10 inches of extra sea level is not that much. But where sea level makes a huge difference is during storms when there's waves and during king tides. So if you have sea level rise of, of um, sea level because of climate change rising and storms and king tides, that's when you've got four or five foot waves c crashing into cities that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't have it. That infrastructure is flooded, it's wrecked, you have to rebuild it. Uh, we saw that a little bit um, in, in Louisiana where the coastal marshes were overwhelmed. Uh, there were places in Louisiana that were protected by oyster beds and marshes before, um, but they were no longer that way. Um, so, so that's where I think that the specifics come in. Um, we all see, have seen pictures of waves crashing up against seawalls and flooding things. And each one of those is a small disaster uh, for the people that live right there. I think some of the questions that I often see people ask around this is, really, Miami's going away, really? <laughs> and when, what, can you tell us a little more? What are the predictions sort of because saying? Because you don't care about that? Or no, 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 I, th I think, <laughs> or I you think don't believe there's, that. I think it's a hard thing for people yeah. to wrap their mind around in terms of, you know, the city that everybody knows in one way that it's really um, not going to be there anymore. Have any of you been to Waikiki? So the reason why Waikiki is still there is because there's a reef offshore. At low tide, the reef is only about um, two and a half, three feet deep and uh, catches a lot of the waves. Some of you may have actually gone surfing in front of your hotel on Waikiki. It's a great place because those reefs catch the waves and, and, and make them expend all their energy before they get to the shore. A living, growing coral reef can capture 97% of the energy of the waves that hit it. Now you take a reef that's kind of dead, like the one in front of Waikiki, um, but it's still there because it's rock, and you add another meter of sea level on top of that, and those are no longer catching the three and four and five foot waves. Those three and four and five foot waves are gonna be washing up on the shore. That, that shore, that, that beach won't sustain it. And so the life of all those hotels and that incredibly wonderful place to go and, and, be, and do recreation is dependent upon the interplay of the reef and sea level, and that's changing. Absolutely. So another question from the audience is, haven't we already passed the tipping point? For? For <laughs> many of the negative consequences of climate change. So um, I don't believe so. Um, we have passed a tipping point where we'll notice them and we'll pass the tipping point where you could call them extreme, um, but we have not passed the tipping point for um, a many of those effects. And, and the one that's very particular to the ocean that I'll bring up here is acidification. So acidification is a serious problem for most organisms that grow shells, corals and mollusks especially, but not yet. Current levels of acidification in the open ocean are not yet high enough to have this devastating effect. But if we keep going with emission levels the way they are now, by the end of the century, they will be a serious problem. And if we don't actually shift the uh, de debate from 
mitigation and building seawalls to actually reducing CO2, then a lot of the way the ocean works as an ecosystem, giving us food and coastal protection and all that, will, won't work after that. So in, in that case, the tipping point is, is decades away. Right. But there's also a huge inertia mm -hmm. in making it stop. Right. So we have to solve the problem now in order to um, be able to stop it before it gets to that point. The, the, the analogy that I, I like to use is stopping distance. You know, you're, you're driving in a highway, what's the stopping distance of, the, of, you, of your car? Um, if you're going 40 miles an hour, the rule of thumb is you guys are about to take your driver's tests, right? <laughs> right? So the rule of thumb is four car lengths for, uh, for 40 miles an hour about. Uh, we make 16-year-olds know about stopping distance to get a driver's license. The stopping distance for climate change is long. Yeah. It's decades. And so this is when we need to be putting on the brakes now so we don't reach those. And there Tipping are points. definitely things we can do to put on those brakes. Right. So, so um, I guess a number of people in the audience have had questions about plastics in the ocean. Right? This has been in the news a lot in terms of the, the negative impact of our plastic waste and, and making its way into parts of the ocean. Can you talk a little bit about the impact of that and how you see maybe the interaction of that waste in our ocean and, and some of these other issues you've mentioned today? Yeah, uh, plastic pollution in the ocean is, is a huge problem. It's less connected to climate change than some of the other issues, but it's so visceral and so obvious. Um, and it does connect in a, in a lot of ways in terms of reducing the ability of marine life to thrive um, when we really need it to thrive to, in the face of climate change. Um, plastics uh, flow into the ocean from all over, and it's a reflection of the growing human population along coasts. A huge amount goes in through watersheds. Plastic doesn't just appear in the ocean, it flows into the ocean, things that are not picked up. Um, as it gets into the ocean, uh, it breaks down into smaller particles. It's, a, it's, it's consumed by seabirds, by turtles. As it breaks down further into microparticles, it's consumed by fish and by, by filter feeders. Uh, and that, that plastic is going somewhere. Uh, estimates are in the next 10 or 20 years there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And um, we're not have any way of getting it back out. So a lot of the effort has been in a pretty wise way of saying, let's stop it going in so that we have less of a problem. And so that's why you have things like plastic bag bans in a lot of coastal cities and maybe even here. Um, you have pla um, encouraging people to not use uh, single-use plastics as much as possible. Um, and in some way, it's been a really good way for individual people to say, I do care about these global things. There's this little thing that I can do, and maybe it's not going to change the world, but I can do it, and I'll do it. And that'll just help. It'll help a little bit. And if we all do a little bit of help a little bit, then, then it turns into a big help. Um, at the end of the game, preventing plastics from flowing in is what it's going to what it's going to be about. Um, and it's affecting wildlife that we would really care about: the turtles, the seals, the the seabirds. Um, and they make us feel better when we see them and we know we're protecting them because we know that they're, they're part of our, our life and our environment too. Good. Okay, I think we're gonna have to stop there for now. Let's thank our speaker again.